It is good to see you. Good morning. Glad you could be here and worship with us at Farmington Baptist Church on this uh, rainy Sunday morning. If you would, stand up with us. Stand up with us and let's sing, Send the Light. <laughs> There's a call comes ringing o'er the restless wave. Send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. We have heard the Macedonian call today. Send the light, send the light, and a golden offering at the cross we lay. Send the light, send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine forevermore. Let us not grow weary in the work of love. Send the light, send the light. Let us gather jewels for a crown above. Send the light, send the light. shore to shore, send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore, light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore, send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Let's take time to uh, shake hands, make everybody feel welcome this morning. Blessed presence live, ever his praises sing. Love's 
so mighty and so true, merits my soul's best songs. Faithful, loving service to, to Him belongs. Love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. Love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. His will obey. He, your Savior, wants to be be saved today. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help. You can be seated for just a moment. Brother Ben will come and make the uh, morning announcements for us. All right. We are thankful you're in the Lord's house today. I know it's a nasty day outside, but aren't you thankful we've got a sanctuary to come in out of the uh, weather and uh, be together and worship the Lord. We're glad you're here with us. Hope you was able to find a bulletin. You look around and grab one. Really good article. Brother James Beller was a mentor to me. He passed away a few years ago, and uh, anything he writes is worth reading, and uh, I thought that was a really good article uh, there on the front. I, I was able to put part of, their, uh, part of it on the front. On the inside, several things to... Uh, uh, to remember, today is the deadline to sign up for youth camp. Brother Jamie's here if you got any questions for him about that. So the sign-up sheet is in the foyer. If you want to sign up your uh, uh, your child, your grandchild, sign up somebody. If you can ask Jamie if you got any questions. Uh, but today's the deadline to sign up, and then payment uh, needs to be turned in by the, uh, the end of the month. So uh, keep that in, in mind. We started a new Sunday school quarter, so if you want to keep your book uh, to, uh, to, to study, that's fine. But if you're going to throw it away, be sure to put it back in the box in the old fellowship hall and uh, we'll, be, we'll send it over for uh, missionaries to use uh, overseas so remember that Tuesday is going to be the uh, uh, the kids going to uh, the Venture River so see Miss Heidi if you got any questions about that they have a good good time doing that looks like the weather is going to be all right so remember that on uh, Tuesday when, uh, Wednesday will be our business meeting and our meal so keep that in mind our potluck meal over in the uh, uh, the gym at uh, 6 30 and next Sunday will be Father's Day so looking forward to a great uh, Sunday Father's Day We'll have donuts for with uh, Dad that morning to get us started. Uh, so keep that in mind, and we'll look forward to uh, to a great day uh, next Sunday. So uh, keep that in mind. All the things going on in our church. We're thankful you're here this morning. Let's go to the Lord and a word of prayer and ask the Lord to bless us and to be with us this morning. Brother David Carter, won't you pray for us this morning, brother, if you will. Greg, you come, brother. Uh, Jody, if you can take uh, the other uh, voices out of Lisa's monitor, if you can. All right, everybody stand up. Everybody stand up, and uh, let's sing uh, one, of, uh, one of your favorite songs, isn't it? All right, one of Jana's favorite songs. He is Jehovah. He is Jehovah, God of creation. He is Jehovah, Lord God Almighty, the balm of Gilead, the rock of ages. He is Jehovah, the God that healeth thee. Sing alleluia, sing alleluia, sing alleluia, sing alleluia. He is Jehovah. He is Jehovah, the God that healeth thee. 
He is the great I am, the God of Abraham, Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace I am, the God of Israel, the everlasting one. He is Jehovah, the God that he let thee. Sing Alleluia, sing Alleluia, sing Alleluia, sing Alleluia. He is Jehovah, Lord God Almighty. He is Jehovah, the God that he let thee. He's your provider, Jehovah Jireh. God of Messiah, the Son He sent to you, He testified of Him. He is Jehovah, the God that He let thee. Sing Alleluia, sing Alleluia, sing Alleluia, sing Alleluia. He is Jehovah, Lord God Almighty. He is Jehovah. Miss Lindsay Weeks is going to bring the uh, special for us here in uh, just a moment. Let's finish up with a song called He Is Here. He is here, hallelujah. He is here, amen. He is here. generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name 
is the highest, your name is the greatest, your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all. And the angels cry, holy, all creation cries, holy, you are lifted high, holy, holy forever. If you been forgiven and if you've been redeemed sing the song forever to the Lamb and if you walk in freedom and if you bear his name sing the song forever to the Lamb sing the song forever with the angels cry holy all creation cries holy you are lifted high holy holy forever hear your people sing Holy to the King of Kings, holy you will always be, holy, holy forever. Your name is the highest, your name is the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all your name is the highest your name is the greatest your name stands above them all all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all and the angels cry holy all creation cry Holy, you are lifted high. Holy, holy forever. Hear your people sing. Holy to the King of Kings. Holy, Everything God does is good. Everything God does is right. And God is uh, holy, holy, holy. We appreciate uh, Miss Lindsay singing that song for us uh, this morning. We're going to be in the book of 1 Samuel chapter number 7 this morning. Hope you have your Bibles with you. 1 Samuel chapter number 7. Oh. 
All right, 1 Samuel chapter number 7. We're going to read verses 12 and verse number 13. Thinking about this thought, God still answers prayer. Uh, we love that, that old song that uh, had that title, God Still Answers Prayer. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 12 and verse number 13. 1 Samuel chapter 7, there in the Old Testament. And uh, verse Number 12 and verse 13. The Bible says, Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpeth and Shin and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. And so the Philistines were subdued and they came no more into the coast of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time together, Lord. I, I pray you teach us something from your word. And Lord, I, I pray it just wouldn't be just head knowledge that we'd learn a, a true, important story from Israel's history. Uh, but Lord, I pray we'd make the application. we take the truths that are found in God's word and apply them to our hearts and our lives. Thank you for each one who came out in the weather today. I pray you'd bless each person, each family. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. God still answers uh, prayer. Very interesting story here. You'll notice uh, one thing, and I preached on this in the past. This is a different message years ago. Uh, but I do like in verse 12, I can't help but mention, you'll notice that word Ebenezer. Uh, it's only used a couple of times in the Bible. We will refer to it uh, in the sermon. But this is uh, the motivation. This story is where the motivation for one of my favorite hymns come from. Come thou fount of every blessing. Here I raise my Ebenezer, and we might talk about that a little bit in the sermon. So it's a great story. If you've ever wondered, uh, you've seen an Ebenezer. One of my friends from high school in Muhlenberg County pastors the new Ebenezer Baptist Church. Uh, and you wonder what, sometimes we'll see churches with that name. There's a town uh, down in outside of Real Foot Lake named uh, uh, Ebenezer, Tennessee. And of course, Ebenezer Scrooge, all that comes uh, from this text right here. Well, let's look at it. And uh, we see these stories. We're going to look kind of at this from verses 7 down through verse 13. When you see a story like this in the Bible, God didn't put every battle that Israel fought in the Bible. God didn't put every battle that Israel fought against the Philistines, every battle Samuel or Saul or Jonathan or David. But every story God put in the Bible, I've told you many times, there's no filler in your Bible. God put everything in there. For a reason. Some of it's easier to understand than others. But every story, every verse has an eternal purpose. It's got a divine truth God is trying to teach us. So let's look at this story. It's history. It's inspired history. It's true. It really happened thousands of years ago. But more than just being history, it's relevant for you and I. Today, So let's look at it and see what God has us to, has to teach us. If you're taking notes, I want to give you some D's this morning and uh, notice some things. I want you to see, first of all, you notice the desperate need of the people. The desperate need of the people. You see in verse number 7 where it says there uh, that when the Philistines heard the children of Israel were gathered together to Mizpeth, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And the children of Israel heard it. And notice what it says. It says they were afraid of the Philistines. I'm going to tell you in our text, the Israelites had a desperate need. Now if you know anything about the Philistines, what do we mainly know? We know they had a great champion. We know they had a, a champion named Goliath that was taller than anybody else. And just reading the story of David and Goliath tells us a little bit about the Philistines. Goliath, the Bible says, had a, a massive spear. He had a new sword. He had the best weaponry. He had a shield that was so large that a man went in front of him and, and packed a shield for him unless he was in combat. The Philistines had giants and Goliath wasn't the only one. The Bible says Goliath had four brothers. And so the Philistines, you've got this group of people who are mighty warriors. They've got heroes. They've got giants among them who can fight better than anybody else. The Philistines have the best armor. They've got the best weapons. And then when you go to 1 Samuel chapter 13 and verse 22, not only do the Philistines have giants, better swords, better spears, better shields, better armor, 
But they've also, they control the blacksmiths. The Bible says in that verse, 1 Samuel 13 and verse 22, that among all the Israelites, there were only two swords. King Saul had a sword, and King John, and his son, Prince Jonathan, had a sword. Everybody else, if they went to battle, maybe they'd grab a hoe, maybe they'd grab an axe, maybe they'd grab a, a staff, a club or something. But the Philistines had all the spears, they had all the shields, only two swords in the entire Israelite army. So the, 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 the Philistines, they're tough warriors, they've got better weapons, better armor, and more weapons than the Philistines have. And they come against Israel, and the Israelites are sore afraid. They've got a desperate need in verse 7. And I read about that and it reminds us how often do we get in a mess in our life? How often do we get in a tough spot to where you and I have got a desperate need? Just think about spiritual things. You might say, well, well, this morning, Brother Ben, there's somebody in my family I'm concerned about. Preacher, I've got a desperate need. I've got a, a, a spouse. I've got a child, a grandchild, a parent, a grandparent, somebody that I'm kin to, somebody I went to school with, somebody I work with, and they're lost. They've never been saved. They're not a Christian. They've never been born again. And there's a desperate need that you want to see that person saved in your life. Uh, we often have desperate needs. We see people that are lost. You know, Jesus talked about how uh, the, 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 the parable of the souls. And remember, some was on rocky and some was thorny and some was hard ground. And we look around, there's a lot of people, their life is full of thorns. Their life is, it, it, they're hard hearts. We see all people, some, you may have a desperate need of somebody you think about that you know that's, that's lost. It may be somebody that's backslidden. You, you say, preacher, I've got a need right now. Brother Ben, I, I've got somebody I care about in my life. They used to be in this church. They used to be in another church. And they used to be there all the time. They loved God. They served God. They enjoyed church. But they've got out of church now. And you think about that term backslid, it's a biblical term. It means to go backwards, right? To fall back. And they've kind of slid back out of church this morning. The Bible uses the term stiff-necked and its idea of, uh, of being a, uh, just being stubborn, uh, refusing to, to do anything about your sin. And sometimes we get stiff-necked and we refuse to, to get right with the Lord. Maybe you've got a burden on your heart. You've got a desperate need of somebody you care about. that They're not lost. You hope that they're saved. They made a profession of faith. You think they're saved, but maybe they've just fallen away from the Lord. They've fallen out of church. They backslid. It could be a lot of things. We think about the condition of our churches. I mean, it's, it, we look around and we're blessed here at Farmington, but so many churches across America are struggling. We was talking about in Sunday school, they tell us that, and Brother Jamie can tell you this, is he, he studied this before, how they say maybe as, as many as two out of every three young persons, in, even in, in conservative churches when they graduate, fall out of church. There's so many things that are desperate needs in our life. We, we see situations we're concerned about. It may be a broken family in your life. You think about somebody, a family that needs to be restored. It may be something personal for you. You're not thinking about anybody else. You're thinking about your own life. You say, preacher, I haven't told anybody. I ain't even told my, my spouse. I haven't told my kids. But I've got a desperate need in my life. Maybe I'm going through some trial, some, some health concern, Brother Ben. I, 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 I'm going through a financial situation. I'm going through some sort of storm, some sort of trial and tribulation. But we often find desperate needs. And so God places a story in the Bible that's true. But remember, there's no filler in the Bible. God's not saying, God didn't say, well, I'm going to give them the Bible. And I need an extra chapter here. Let me just know. God says, I'm going to put a true story in there. It really happened. It happened just like I'm going to give it to you. But I'm trying to teach those folks at Farmington something this morning. They had a desperate situation. They were outnumbered, outgunned. That They're facing giants who are better armed and armored. What are they going to do? What do we do when we have desperate situations? Here's where it gets good. Look at verse 8 and 9. Not only the desperate situation, the desperate need, but the answer there, the diligent, the second point, all of them start with the letter D, diligent prayer. I love verse 8 and 9. Here's the key. It says, And the children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry 
What's he talking about? Not to, to, to whine, but to pray. Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us that he will, underline that word will in your Bible, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. And verse 9, the last sentence says, Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel and the Lord heard him. I'd almost underline those last couple words in verse 9 as well. God heard his prayer. We see the diligent prayer. What do we do when we're desperate situations, when we've got desperate need? It's why we title the sermon, God Still Answers Prayer. We pray about it. The people went to Samuel and said, Samuel, it's a mess. The Philistines are coming. We're outnumbered. They got better weapons. They got giants. What are we going to do? Samuel, pray for us. Now, it's all right to have people pray for, for you. When you get in a situation, ask Brother Ben or ask somebody else you've got confidence in. That's fine to pray for us. But remember, Samuel's the priest. Uh, Samuel is, is there uh, in the, the Old Testament. We're in the New Testament era. Jesus is our high priest. And what's great in the Old Testament, you needed somebody sometimes to pray for you, to intercede for you. But now, every one of us, we can go straight to God, right? The Bible says we're a royal priesthood. They had to have Samuel pray for them in the Old Testament. Today, we go straight to God, right? If you've got a desperate need, you can cry straight to God. You don't need a man, a church, a person. Jesus is the only in-between you need. If you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can go pray and go straight to God in prayer. They cried out to Samuel and said, Samuel, pray for us. And I love what we see in the verse. They said, Samuel, pray that God will answer our prayers. Now the idea of an Ebenezer, you've wondered about that song, you've heard it, Baptists love that song, written by a Baptist preacher, a Baptist historian, Robert Robinson, very interesting guy. Here I raise my Ebenezer. The Ebenezer was a memorial stone. It was a stone of remembrance when they win the battle. Uh, Samuel says, I'm going to put a rock here, and this rock is the Ebenezer stone. And I want everybody, when they see it, to be reminded God gave us the victory. And so the Ebenezer, it's a way of, of remembering. And I think in, in a way, they had an Ebenezer. Because you remember, this isn't the first time they fought the Philistines. These, I think these Israelites, they remembered back to the book of Judges. And they thought, you know, God gave us Samson. And by the power of God and the help of God, Samson was able to whip the Philistines. And we need God to do it again. God, we know you can do it. You beat the Philistines with Samson in the book of Judges. Lord, do it again. God, we're praying. We believe. Samuel, pray for us that God will. He's done it in the past. Pray that he'll do it again. And you see, when we pray... You've got this desperate need in your situation. You've got this desperate uh, situation, this desperate need you're praying about. A lost person, a backslidden person, your family, something personal, a church. It could be any number of things. But there's a burden on your heart. You need to have faith, first of all. Believe God can answer that prayer. And you know how we, we believe? The Ebenezer's in our life. God's done it in the past. Every one of you can say, Preacher, I remember last year. I was in a mess, and God brought me through that. Preacher, I remember 10 years ago, I was in a mess, and God brought me through it. Preacher, I remember 50 years ago, my life was in a mess, and God brought me through it. I've told you many times, when I was a young preacher boy, God taught me this lesson. I, my, it was one of the, I, I, senior in high school, and me and one of my, my best friends, we'd been out, we'd stayed out late at night coon hunting. And I'd been over, in, we was over in Logan County where he was at. And uh, we'd stayed out real late. No cell phones back then. No means of communication uh, besides in old, old school ways. We stayed out late. I was coming home in my S10. And I'd made it past Logan County and my truck started acting up. And I wasn't really sure. I said, it's not, something's not acting right. It's a five speed. And I was shifting gears some. And, and all of a sudden the clutch just went out. That was it. That's all she, she gave Pulled over the side of the road, it's past midnight. Ain't no cell phones. Young people don't understand what it used to be like. What do you do? Well, I'm a too far to walk. Go up and knock on somebody's house. That's all you can do, right? That's all you did back then. I pulled over as far as I could to the side of the road. I'm sitting there praying. And what was worse, I had, had finals the next day, my senior year. I said, man, I've got to get home. I can't be out all late in the night. And I'm sitting there praying. And the Lord taught me a lesson. Never forget this as long as I live. My truck's messed up. It's after midnight. There's a house up there on the hill. I don't know anybody that lives in this part of, 
uh, of Unilburg County there, and I walk up the hill, knock on the door, and it was a boy in my class that was still awake, had a truck, pulled me out of the road. I was kind of halfway in the road, pulled me out, called my dad, and dad was able to come get me. God, God delivered. And every one of you can think about stories like that in your life, can't you? Where you had a difficult situation. Maybe you were praying for your, your spouse or praying for your child and God saved them. You were praying for a friend that had gotten out of church and man, you were praying and you brought that burden to the Lord and left it there and, and God brought them back home. They got back right with the Lord. They're in church. Every one of you can think of situations. Every one of you can say, I can raise my Ebenezer. I was in a mess in the past and God delivered me. The Philistines, they're, 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 again, Israel's fighting them, but God had helped them in the past. They say, Samuel, we believe. We believe. And the Bible says we got to have faith. You know, Matt, I'd write this in the margin, Matthew 21, 22. And all things whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. Matthew 21, 22. And all things whatsoever you ask in prayer, Believing you shall receive. Of course, Genesis 18, 14 says, Is there anything too hard for the Lord? There's not. They had faith. And then you notice in those verses 7 and 8 that Samuel cries out to God in prayer. It says it cry in verse 8. And then verse 9, Samuel cried unto the Lord uh, for, in, for help. We believe. It, this here, the point is the diligent prayer. We believe and we pray. We believe God can answer and we cry out to God for help. The Bible says ask and it shall be given unto you. The Bible says uh, you have not in the book of James because you ask not. Now if we take that at face value and we take the Bible literally. If the Bible says you have not because you ask not. That would mean there's a lot of things in your life that God had answered simply because you haven't asked. You didn't ask in faith or you didn't ask at all. We need to bring those burdens to the Lord in prayer. When I, I was telling Brother Scott over here when I went to Pisgah and I remember Brother Joe Wade. And Brother Scott, you remember Brother Joe. Uh, he passed away not long after I went there. And Brother Joe Wade talked about an old preacher that was there at, at Mount Pisgah in Bose and, uh, named Vernon Turner, Brother V.A. Turner. And he said, Brother Turner would get down there in those bottoms off the hill there in bows, and he'd get down there and he would pray sometimes all night long. And people going out to milk could hear him in the morning down there praying in those, in those woods, crying out to God. And then Brother Turner, matter of fact, he pastored Coldwater. And Brother Eugene, I, I, we've talked about this. I remember Brother, uh, Brother Al Cobb telling me this. He, he would pray and him and Brother Stephen Cobb would get in there, uh, get in a milk barn or get in a hay barn and would cry out to God and pray. We'd pray, prayer. Uh, you have not because you ask not. They're in a mess. They've got a bad situation. The Philistines have got giants, arms, and armor. They ain't got nothing but sticks and two swords. What do they do? They cry out to God believing. They pray in faith. And what's going to happen? What will happen if you've got that situation you're burdened about? And you believe and you pray. Notice the third one. We see first of all the desperate need, the diligent prayer, the definite answer. The definite answer. Look at verse 10. And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offerings, the Philistines drew near to battle with Israel. They're ready to go. But the Bible says, But, but the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomforted them, and they were smitten before Israel. Can you imagine? The Philistines got their men, they're ready to go. Maybe they've got some cavalry, maybe they've got some chariots. They're marching, they're riding out to battle. And all of a sudden the lightning starts to flash across the sky. And all of a sudden the heavens boom with thunder. And the sound of the thunder, the intensity, is focused right on those Philistine soldiers. And man, the bravest of the Philistines begins to lose heart. God is interceding, right? God is responding to their prayer of faith. They prayed, believing, and God answers with a roar of thunder. And the Philistines are spent. The Philistines are discomforted. What would happen? We've got these desperate needs, and we begin to pray about them. And we pray believing. What can God do in those situations? What can happen? You've got somebody lost. You're praying for and man, you've been praying, you've been bringing that burden. Lord, I'm trusting you. Is there anybody that we know that God can't save? 
God can save anybody. Nobody is too far gone, right? God can bring anybody back. You want something good to read this afternoon? You go online, and there's a great article from about 15, 16 years ago called The Devil Got Saved. I love to tell this story. I've told it years ago. But it's about the salvation of General Nathan Bedford Forrest. They called him the Devil Forrest. And you talk about a great general. And nobody knows the rest of the story. Everybody knows part one. But nobody knows part two. Man, Forrest was a great general. He was so great. General Patton. The, the great tank general who defeated the Nazis in North Africa and, and France. We just had the anniversary of D-Day. General Patton learned a lot, of his, uh, a lot of his military strategy by reading and studying the campaigns of Nathan Bedford Forrest. Forrest was a great man. He was down here at Donaldson and the, the, the Union Army had him surrounded. The Confederates said, I guess we're going to have to surrender. And Forrest said, here's a creek. The, the, the creek's over flooded. But me and my men, we're not surrendering. And every one of them just rode across the creek and made it out. Uh, he would tell his men when they would go into battle, you talk about a motivator, he'd be a great basketball coach. He would go to his men and, and there'd be the, uh, the he had, of course a lot of Graves County men and, and he'd go to the Kentucky guys and he'd say, I want the Kentucky boys to be the first one to hit the other side. And he'd go to the Tennessee guys, he'd say, I want the Tennessee boys, you be the first one to hit the enemy. He'd tell every unit that and they'd fight just unbelievable. For us so, during the war, he, he was married to a preacher's daughter. What, wasn't a Christian, never made a profession of faith. As a child, as a teenager, as an adult. 30 times, now you think about this. 30 times during the Civil War, his horse was shot underneath him. 30 times, a bullet or a piece of shrapnel from a cannon killed his horse, but he lived. People would ask him about it. He said, my wife back home is praying for me. And he wasn't an atheist, he wasn't an agnostic, he'd just never come to that point where he put his faith in the Lord. Again, a lot of problems with Forrest. We all know that. He's a lost man. What do you expect? After the war, he goes back to Memphis. His wife, remember, she's a preacher's daughter. She's going to church every Sunday. She loves the Lord, believes the Bible, keeps on inviting her husband. Why don't you come? Why don't you come? Some of Forrest's... Uh, the men that he served with had gotten saved. And they began to witness to him and tell him about the Lord. And he starts going to church. First time in his life since maybe he was a boy. And he goes one Sunday to a church down there in Memphis. And that Sunday the preacher preached on the house built on the rock. And the house built on the sand. The rock is who? The rock of ages. Jesus. Build your house on the rock. You'll be alright when the storms come. You build your house on the sand. Anything else other than Jesus. And the waves are going to bring it down. And the preacher preached that morning and asked everybody there, a huge congregation in Memphis, said, are you built on the rock or is your life built on shifting sand? After the service, Forrest grabbed the preacher by the hand as they were shaking hands and said, I'm a fool. My life is built on the sand. And that night the preacher went, went and visited him at his home. Nathan Bedford Forrest, the devil, old Forrest, they called the devil Forrest, got saved. Now if God can save Nathan Bedford Forrest, is there anybody around God can't save? I mean, the Bible, see, we read and, and we pray with faith. We pray believing, Lord, I'm, I'm praying for my spouse. I'm praying for my child. Lord, I, I'm praying that you'll bring this person I know that maybe they've been saved, but they've drifted away. They backslid like Peter did when he denied the Lord. They backslid like John Mark did when he left uh, Paul and, and Barnabas on the missionary trip. We, we pray, Lord, bring them back home. We pray with faith, believing crying out to God, whatever the situation is, that God might bring your family back together. God might restore your family. In your personal situation, how many personal situations can you think of in the Bible where people prayed and God answered? Hannah had a personal uh, situation, trouble and trial in her life. She prayed, God delivered her. Elijah had a personal trouble in his life. He prayed with faith, God delivered him. David had personal trouble after trouble, giant after giant. He prayed and God delivered him. Esther had trouble in her life personally. She prayed and God delivered we could go all day with this. And the Bible says God is the Alpha and the Omega. He changes not. So if God helped all those people in the Bible, what about you and me? The Lord doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Why doesn't God help us? You have not because you ask not. And whatsoever things you ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. 
We've got to pray. We've got to take that situation and bring it to the Lord in prayer. So many examples I could give you. Robert Robinson, the man who wrote this, uh, this great hymnal. You, you've heard of George Whitfield, the Billy Graham of the colonial America. And, and uh, Robert Robinson was a lost man. He went to hear George Whitfield preach and he got saved and he tells his testimony and stands to two when he says, Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I've come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. And here's his testimony. He says, Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. You remember when Jesus sought you, when Jesus found you, and Jesus saved you. We pray in faith. Let me share this and I'll be done. You notice, last one, this is just real quick, the deliberate response in verse 12, where it says uh, there in verse 12 and 13, and really in verse 11, actually, in verse 11 it says, The men of Israel went out of Mizpeth and they pursued the Philistines and smote them. Israel didn't quit. God answered and they stepped up and they chased the Philistines all the way back to their land. Don't quit. God's going to answer. You keep on praying. What's the application for this text? You keep on praying. Don't you quit on God. Maybe you need to get back in church more active. Lord, you're working. God, you're at work around me. I want to pray. Lord, I'm concerned about my family. I'm concerned about my friends. Get back in church with both feet. Maybe you need to join a New Testament church. Make that commitment where, hey, I, I, I want to be a part of this church. I, I, I want to be here and, and committed to the Lord and serve Him through this local New Testament church. But they didn't quit on God. Don't you quit either. You keep on praying. Maybe you need to start praying. But you keep praying for those desperate situations. Those desperate needs you've got in your life. Whatever they are, we've all got them. You pray and you believe in God to answer. Maybe you're here this morning. Maybe somebody's been praying for you. You've never been saved. How's the person get saved? Walk in the aisle, don't save anybody. Shaking the preacher's hand, don't save anybody. Getting baptized isn't what saves anybody. Taking the Lord's Supper doesn't save anybody. Getting your name on a church roll, that's not how we get saved. We get saved by crying out to the Lord in faith. You Remember the jailer man? Matter of fact, the Bible says there in Acts 16 that Paul and Silas, they'd been praying. And they were praying with faith. Lord, we're in the jail. God, we're praying you'll deliver us. And God not only got them out of jail, God saved the jailer man and his whole family in doing it. But that jailer man, Paul... Tells him, and the jailer said, what must I do to be saved? And Paul says, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. That's how we get saved. Has there ever been a time in your life that you cried out to Jesus in faith? You said yes to the Lord. Lord, I know I'm lost. I've never been saved. You've not always been a Christian. None of us have always been Christians. You've got to be saved somewhere along the line. Lord, I, I, I want to be saved. I want you to come into my life today. I know I'm a sinner. I know you're the Savior. Lord, I believe today. If you've never been saved, cry out to Jesus today. And you can be saved today. If you are a Christian, man, let's keep praying. God answers our prayer. Let's keep moving forward. Let's don't give up. Let's keep pressing on for Jesus today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the, the word of God, the story. Lord, it's a true story. And Lord, it's true, but it's relevant. and encourages us, Lord, when we go through desperate situations to cry out to God in prayer, to pray with faith, and Lord, you'll answer. Lord, I pray you might bless the invitation. If there's one here that needs to be saved, Father, one that needs to join the church, whatever it might be, Lord, I pray you'd work in their life. Lord, help us to be people of prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing, Brother Greg. Let Jesus come into your heart.